Father, as we read of your compassion for this uh, great city of Nineveh, would you uh, move us with compassion even for our city here this morning? Would you give us uh, your heart for the city? Uh, Would you help us to have a fresh uh, experience, a fresh understanding of your grace, of your mercy, of your compassion, and would it move us in such a way that we would serve our city well. And so we pray that you'd come this morning by the power of your Holy Spirit that you'd speak to your people through your word. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in the midst of a sermon series I'm calling For the City, God's Heart for the City in the Story of Scripture. And so um, if you haven't been with us since the start of the series, I'll give you a really brief uh, recap We started back in Genesis and looked at God's original design for the city. We saw that the city was first and foremost God's idea. The city shapes culture. It produces culture like nowhere else. And as such, it has this incredible opportunity to glorify God and also contribute to uh, the common good of our world. And so the city is a place uh, full of cultural innovation, cultural invention, a place uh, with full of ways to bless uh, the world um, that we're living in. But we also saw uh, that the city is a place where people don't always glorify God, where they don't always seek the common good. The city can be a place of intense competition, of ego, of striving, of you know, this dog-eat-dog you know, world, this rat race. And so we all know that world as well, all too well in the city that we live in uh, that is marred um, by sin. We also saw... Um, that cities can be cities of refuge, places for the marginalized, places for the outcast, places for the poor, uh, places for the refugee. Cities have always been places where, where there's justice, where there's um, social services, where uh, the basic, uh, basic you know, necessities of life are provided. And it's always been a magnet for those um, that are on the outside, those that are marginalized. We saw also that Jerusalem was designed as a center for worship. And so we saw last week in Psalm 48 how Jerusalem was supposed to be this beautiful beacon drawing the nations to the worship of uh, the true and living God. And even after um, Israel's city ceased to be uh, places of refuge, even after Jerusalem ceases to be a center of worship, God doesn't abandon the city. In fact, in the prophets we get Uh, perhaps the clearest uh, picture uh, of God's heart for the city. And we're going to be looking in the book of Jonah today. And uh, Jonah, one of the most famous pieces of literature in the Bible, of course, we've all heard the wonderful children's stories uh, about it, but Jonah is not so much a a story about a a whale and, you know, this great little kid story, great illustrations. Uh, and it's not so much a story about a great prophet either, because frankly, Jonah is, is kind of the rebellious prophet. He's like running uh, the other direction. Rather, what I want you to see in uh, the book of Jonah is God's uh, missionary heart for the city. We see over and over again uh, beautiful pictures of God's passion for uh, the city. And so my aim for this morning's message is that we would be a church with God's heart for the city. And so this morning, if you're taking notes, I want to look at three different things. I want to look at first the great city of Nineveh, which Jonah is going to be sent to. Uh, Second, I want to look at Jonah's hatred for the city. We're going to see uh, Jonah reacts very strongly against God's call to go to the city. And then finally, we're going to look at God's heart for the city. So let's look at this great city of Nineveh here in in, uh, Jonah 1 here, verses uh, 1 uh, and 2. It's interesting, if you are uh, following along in the text here, uh, we read in verse 1 and 2, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up to me, or has come up before me. And so what, what I want you to notice here, first of all, is that there's this expression here that Nineveh is that great city. And uh, we see it here in 1 1. We also see, or 1 2. We also see it in chapter 3, verse 2. Once uh, Jonah has been picked up by the great fish and sent back to Nineveh, God says, Go to that great city once again. And then finally, in chapter 4, verse 11, the kind of the punchline of the entire story, um, God says once again, And shall I not pity Nineveh that? great city. And so we have this refrain three times over in the book of Jonah about this great city. And so we've got to wonder what, what's so important about this 
great city of Nineveh. Well, the Hebrew word here for great has essentially two meanings, just like it does um, in English. And I want to look at both of them because I think it really highlights um, why Jonah is being sent to this city. The first meaning of great is simply big, right? If something is great, it's large. We learn from chapter 3.3 3, that it took Jonah three days to deliver his message at the many city gates, the marketplace, and perhaps the royal palace. And so this is a large city. It took Jonah three days to make his way through it, preach uh, uh, the message that God had commanded him to give. Uh, we learn at the end of the book that there are 120,000 people in the city uh, that make this a great city. In the ancient world, that was unheard of. That was a massive number of people. Of course, uh, today we've got, you know, almost a little short of 200,000 right here in Grand Rapids. Uh, but in the ancient Near East, in Nineveh, 120,000 people was a massive uh, city center, and that probably included the surrounding region as well. So God is concerned about the city simply based on the sheer number of people. There's 120,000 people in this city. God loves people, and so God loves cities, because cities are places where people are most concentrated, where people gather together most closely. So, so that meaning of this great city first is it's a large city, it's a big city, there are a lot of people there, uh, but the second meaning of great here in this text is that it's an important city. It's an influential city. Um, Nineveh uh, often served as the capital of the great Assyrian Empire. And so it was one of the great cities of the ancient Near East, one of the most influential, one of the most powerful cities. What happened in Nineveh, uh, the ripple effects of that were felt throughout uh, the rest of the ancient Near East. And so this is a very significant city, and God is concerned about this city because what happens in Nineveh, what happens in this great city, right, it's going to impact everything that's happening in the rest of the ancient world. And, and so God is concerned for this city, first because it's large, second because it's influential. And those are two things that cities tend to be. The great cities of our world, they're obviously large, they're full of people, obviously that need Jesus, but they're also places of influence, cultural centers where uh, our culture is often shaped. And so if you look around the country, you look at centers like New York City, right? They're centers of finance. If you go out to California, out to LA, and it's centers of movie and entertainment. If you go out to Houston, it's a center for energy. If you go out to Silicon Valley, that's the tech capital of the world. Cities are places of not only dense population and people, but they're also centers of influence. It's where culture is shaped. You go to Washington, D.C., it's a center of government, of course, in the world. And so cities are significant, and God has a heart for cities because, uh, first of all, of their size and also because of their significance, because of their influence in the world. Uh, but not only do we learn that this is a great city, just from the first two verses, we also learn that the evil in that city is great. And so... Uh, we see that, you know, Jonah's called to call out against it for their evil has come down uh, before me. And so the Assyrians, if you don't know much of your ancient history, if you haven't brushed up much on that in a while, the Assyrians were one of the most brutal, uh, oppressive civilizations in all of human history. Um, historian Simon Anglum notes, while historians tend to shy away from analogies, it's tempting to see the Assyrian Empire, which dominated the Middle East from 900 to 612 BC as a historical forebear of Nazi Germany, an aggressive, murderously vindictive regime supported by a magnificent and successful war machine. As the German army of World War II, the Assyrian army was the most technologically and doctrinally advanced of its day and was a model for others for generations afterwards. The Assyrians were the first to make extensive use of iron weaponry, and not only were iron weapons superior to bronze, but could be mass-produced, allowing the equipping of very large armies. Indeed, so you have this massive, influential empire, but it's also an evil empire, and it has spread its power and influence through the edge of the sword, through this massive war machine, through intimidation, fear, uh, domination. Um, that's the kind of city that it was. And about 100 years ago, before Jonah's mission in Nineveh, the Assyrian war machine marched into Palestine and trounced uh, 10 kings that had gathered together in the Battle of Karkar to uh, attempt to resist the Assyrian domination of that region. And so King Ahab, the king of Israel, was killed in that battle, and Israel became 
uh, tribute, they became tribute states, they became vassals of uh, Assyria. And so Jonah's family and Jonah lived in northern Israel, and they would have lived under the thumb of this oppressive regime, this uh, world terror. And so Israel couldn't even escape the influence of this great uh, empire, and they would remain a vassal state right up until Jonah's time. And when God called Jonah to Nineveh, however, the Assyrians were, uh, they were stuck at this point in uh, one of the low points in their empire. During the reign of Asher Dan III, uh, 771 to 754, the Assyrian empire was struck with a series of calamities, several serious famines, a rare solar eclipse, and rebellions throughout the cities of the empire. And so this great empire uh, at this point is kind of at its knees. God has got this empire right where he wants them, uh, and God is graciously going to send his prophet along to call them to repent. So he wants to give this evil empire a chance to repent. And so uh, we've got this wonderful city. It's great, it's influential, and it's evil. And that gives us maybe a little bit of an opportunity at the beginning of the sermon here to think, what's your attitude towards the city? What do you think about when you think of the city? Do you think of this great, big, evil metropolis, crime, poverty, homelessness, uh, racism? Is, is that what you're thinking? Gangs? Uh, is the city to you this kind of blighted thing? Or do you think of the city maybe as a really wonderful place to go grab coffee and, you know, experience arts and culture and do art prize and all that fun stuff? Or really are you kind of indifferent to the city? You're like, well, I just have too much in my life going on to really care too much about something big and high level like the city. I'm just trying to keep up with, like, my job and kids and work and life. And, you know, these grandiose visions of the city don't really capture much of our attention well, what's noteworthy, really, as we're considering this city of Nineveh, is Jonah's response. It's really what makes for a wonderful um, story here, because God's going to send his prophet to Nineveh to reach this great pagan city, this evil city. And, and what we expect here in verse 3 is something like um, this, right? And so Jonah rose up, and he went to Nineveh, and he passionately preached about the grace and the mercy and the goodness of God. And everyone in that great city repented. But that's not quite how the story goes, is it? The story kind of throws us for a loop. God's prophet goes on the run instead. And, and we're invited into this story to look a little bit at our own hearts as we think about the great cities of our world. And so, so this book of Jonah is going to invite us in to an opportunity to look at how we think about the city through the eyes of Jonah, through the lens of Jonah. And so in verse 3, what we really read in verse 3 is that Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare and went down into it and to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. And so shockingly, God's prophet, uh, when he is called by God to go and reach this pagan city, uh, to proclaim, give them an opportunity to repent, he is heading the opposite direction. So let's look at Jonah's not very good plan that he has laid out for himself. So instead of partnering with God in an unprecedented mission project to one of the most influential cities in the ancient Near East, Jonah decided to catch a ship going roughly 2,500 miles in the opposite direction to Tarshish. And I think we have a little slide up here that gives you a little visual, little visual on where Jonah is is going in this trip here, or maybe not. We might get it up there at some point. Um, but anyways, he's about to go 2,500 miles uh, towards Spain, the opposite direction to where God has calling him. And this trip, um, if you're anything familiar with ancient maritime travel, would have taken probably up to a year uh, to complete with many trips along the way. This would have been an incredibly expensive trip. Jonah perhaps sold his house, uh, pretty much gave up his life savings to go out there and run from God's presence to go over to uh, Tarshish. And his not very good plan, as he is making a run for it, begins to unravel when God sends a great storm to stop him dead in his tracks. And, and as you're following through the story, uh, it's remarkable. The crew is freaking out, as people will be when their lives are in danger and they're about um, to die. Uh, but what's very interesting here is that it's actually the, the pagan captain that goes down, wakes Jonah up, who's sleeping in the hold, and says, Jonah, please pray for us. We, we need your help. And, 
And so you have the prophet asleep in the hold, indifferent to God's call on his life, indifferent to this great city of Nineveh, indifferent to the fate of the crew. And you have this pagan sea captain who's like, please pray for us. Like, you know, you're a prophet. Isn't that what you're supposed to be uh, doing? And when the crew casts lots to see uh, finally whose fault this whole storm is, Jonah gives us a great, one of the great theological statements here in uh, the book of Jonah. He says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land in verse 9. And so he gives this wonderful declaration. Look, I'm a Hebrew, and, you know, I fear God, and he's the creator. He made the heavens and the earth, and, you know, he's, he's great. And, and he's got this wonderfully doctrinally accurate understanding of God. And, but for some reason, he thinks that he can make a run for it and somehow escape from this God. He's like, I know the God who made the land and the sea, but I'm, I'm running away on a ship on the sea thinking that somehow I'm going to outrun um, this God. And then Jonah finds himself in the rather embarrassing position of explaining that he's the problem, right? He's fleeing from the presence of this great God who he so proudly claims. And he tells the crew that they have to throw him overboard to escape God's justice. At the same point, he knows this God, but he's in direct rebellion against him. He's running the opposite uh, direction. And so the men reluctantly carry out the orders of this strangely conflicted prophet who knows the God of heaven and earth, but isn't obeying him at the moment. They kind of are convinced to finally throw him overboard, and a great fish comes and uh, swallows Jonah up, retrieves him, and carries him back to where he started again. And our uh, Narrator is not a marine biologist, and so he's not particularly concerned whether it was a great whale or a fish or what kind of species of animal that it might be. What our narrator is really concerned to say is that God is the creator, as the creator of heaven and earth, as the one who made the sea and the dry land. He has absolutely no difficulty suspending the laws of nature to pick up his prophet and move him back to where he needs uh, to be. And one of the really, I think, jarring ironies of this book is that this prophet who has his theology down cold, who can proudly claim his lineage as a Hebrew who fears the God of heaven, uh, is living in blatant disobedience to God. Is, isn't that shocking? Isn't that, it should be jarring to you, right? This guy, he's got his theology figured out. He knows who God is, and yet he's living in direct conflict with the God of the universe. Can you relate in your own personal? I know I can, right? I'm the pastor. I got all the theology. I got all the knowledge, and yet... You know, I find myself in my life acting like God is not in control, acting like God didn't make the heavens and the earth and freaking out because, you know, stuff is going on in my life and I'm missing the reality of who God is and what he's done. And, and that's part of the reality, right? Living life here in this fallen world, isn't it? You know, oftentimes, right, those who claim the name of Jesus, who have great theology, right, sometimes we... we <laughs> We, we let people down. We say stupid things. We do stupid things. We are not the shining beacon that we're supposed to be. And sometimes you look around you and you see people um, that are atheists, that are agnostics, and they're living wonderful lives. And they, they, they're living far better than their theology. They may be moral relativists, but they're great upstanding folks and they serve in their community. And, and, and we find ourselves in there. And Jonah invites us into this conflict, right? Into this tension in our world, right? He's got the right theology, but he's in blatant disobedience to God. The pagan sailors who, who, who've got all these pagan, this pantheon of pagan deities, they're the nice guys in the story. They're the ones that are calling out to God. They're like, Jonah, we don't want to throw you into the water. You seem like a nice guy. And he's like, no, you've got to pitch me. And, and yet again, it's this, this conflicted behavior here in the story that really challenges us, right, to wrestle with our own hypocrisy, our, the own inconsistencies um, in our lives. Uh, it's interesting, even after his encounter with, with this great fish, Jonah still doesn't seem to have learned his lesson. And so in chapter 2, um, we, we see his response uh, uh, listed for us here in verses 2. And I, I just love how this scripture gives us just really frank, very bold. Uh, we're saying, here, here's how God's people respond. Here's how they act. But here's his response here in chapter 2. Uh, he, prays out, he prays to God that Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. 
All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I'm driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayers came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry ground. And what I want you to notice in this prayer is that Jonah's clearly thankful to God, right? But I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice you. Jonah is really happy that he didn't die. Jonah is happy that, that God did not, you know, smite him on the spot. He's happy to be delivered. He's glad that he didn't die and drown and all that other terrible stuff. But I want you to notice here is that Jonah concludes his prayer saying that salvation belongs to the Lord, but Jonah still can't believe that God's salvation could be extended to anyone else outside of Israel, outside of God's people. He still has a very blind kind of ethnocentric perspective on uh, the world. John Walton, the commentator, notes, the lesson that Jonah seems to have learned was not that it was wrong to disobey the Lord and try and escape one's commission, but rather that it is fruitless. Jonah, we might suggest, we suggest, was not repentant, but was resigned to the facts. He was to go to Nineveh one way or the other. The Lord would not even allow Jonah's death to interfere with his mission. And so after um, the fish uh, spits him out, God commissions Jonah a second time. So we get kind of take two on this whole situation here in chapter 3, verse 1. And God calls him once again to uh, the city of Nineveh. Then the Lord came, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it the message that I tell to you. And so Jonah gets another opportunity, and this time he's going to go, he's going to preach, he's not necessarily going to like it, but he's going to preach the message that God has told him to give. And so he proclaims this dire message of judgment that we see in verse 4. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's journey, and he called out, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Very positive, optimistic message there. Yeah, you would think, you know, and just, you just imagine walking downtown Grand Rapids today and with a little sign. Actually, there are people like this from time to time. But could you just imagine, you know, going downtown Grand Rapids? Uh, now Grand Rapids will be overthrown in 40 days. Like, I mean, imagine just the looks that you would get today in our very nice, tolerant, uh, pluralistic society. Uh, you, just, you just need to imagine this guy going to Assyria. Like, these were the guys that, like, impaled people on pikes and let them die for, like, days and days and days. Like, they slaughtered people, chopped off their hands, eyes, various other... Like, I mean, these were not a friendly, nice group of people to go and give this kind of message to. Uh, but Jonah goes, and he gives the message, 40 days. Nineveh is going to be uh, overthrown, and... What we see here is a very surprising thing happen. We see the people of Nineveh repenting. So in verse 5, And the people of Nineveh believed God. They called for a fast, put on sackcloth, from the greatest of them to the least of them. Then the word reached the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, sat in ashes, and he issued a proclamation and published through Nineveh, By the decree of the king and his nobles, let neither man nor beast herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not feed or drink water, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth, and let them call out mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who knows? God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And so it's like Jonah's um, worst nightmare here, right? They, They repent, you know, and they change their heart. They They change their ways, their theology is pretty sketchy, right? They don't really know, have a good grasp of who this God is. They use kind of the pagan word for God. They don't use, you know, the covenant name for uh, God. They don't convert to Judaism or anything like that. Um, But they, you know, legitimately repent before God. And we know this because in verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. And so what we have here is this pagan empire, this great pagan empire, 
um, repenting. They're willing to turn from their evil ways, from the violence, from the exploitation, uh, from the things that are grieving God's heart, and they're willing to turn. And, and we know that this repentance doesn't last a terribly long time because uh, by the time uh, the next king along, King tiglath Pileser, comes along, a few decades later, they're out there actually conquering uh, Israel and actually defying Israel's God. And, and so we know that this repentance is, is very short-lived sort of window of repentance, and yet it's authentic, and God is doing something in their hearts. God is granting a reprieve from the judgment that was coming. Uh, but what's really gripping here is Jonah's response, right? This is his moment. He's just been on the biggest stage of his ministry career. He's got to announce God's you know, judgment to the greatest city in the ancient world. And there's been an unprecedented, it's been a revival. I mean, there's been this remarkable turning to the God of the Hebrews uh, all of a sudden from the king all the way down. And listen to Jonah's response. This is so telling. He says in verse 1, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry, and he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country, that this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish? For I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord says, Do you do well to be angry? Isn't, isn't this a remarkable text? I mean, where do we even begin? I mean, again, the theology of Jonah is wonderful, isn't it? He's just spot on, right? Not only is God the creator who made the land and the sea, he's also the redeemer of Israel. He's gracious, he's merciful, he's abounding in steadfast love. He's just this wonderful God who, who relents from disaster when people repent and turn to him with all their hearts. And it's, uh, it's this wonderful, beautiful news, and yet... Jonah, again, is angry. He's frustrated that, that God's grace and God's mercy might be extended beyond his little tribe, beyond his little ethnic group, beyond the people of God at that time, beyond Israel. He's angry. He's angry to the point where he's ready to kill himself. Like, that's how angry this guy is about God's grace being poured out on this pagan city. There's this crazy disconnect, isn't there, between what Jonah believes, that he serves the God of heaven and earth, his gracious and merciful God, and yet his attitude towards the city is toxic, right? His attitude towards the city is absolutely, they deserve to be judged, condemned, and uh, pulverized, essentially. This is Jonah's attitude towards the city, and it's coming from someone with perfectly orthodox theology. He understands the true and living God, and yet there's this incredible disconnect in his life. And it's, it's supposed to be jarring to us. It's supposed to uh, shake us up. And of course, God asked him, quite, do you do well to be angry? What a wonderful question. Like, d does your anger really make any sense if you truly believe that I'm the Lord of heaven and earth? If you truly believe in, that I'm gracious, that I'm compassionate, that I'm merciful? Like, if you really believe all that, sh should you be angry or should you not be rejoicing that this great city is turning in repentance? And of course, Jonah has no answer. He, he sulks outside of the city here, we see in, in verse 5, for a little pity party. Then Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself. And he sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. It's interesting, if he were heading back to Israel, he would have gone west. But instead he heads out to the east of the city to kind of camp out there, have a little pity party for himself. And he's still hoping perhaps maybe God will... Uh, change his mind and maybe still like rain down like fire and brimstone on the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. And because Jonah doesn't get the lesson, in God's grace and in God's mercy, God sends him a little object lesson, which we read in our scripture reading this morning uh, that we see in verse 6. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant, but when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished 
in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons that know their right hand from their left and also much cattle? Isn't this interesting? God gives him this object lesson of this plant that comes up to shade him from the intense heat of the Near Eastern sun. And, and Jonah has this incredible compassion on this plant. He's like, wow, I just love this plant. And God's saying, wait a minute, you, you've got compassion on this plant that's shading you from the sun, and yet you don't have any compassion for this great city of Nineveh, this great pagan city that doesn't know their right hand from your left. This is unbelievable, Jonah. Are you, you're missing the point. People are more important than plants. And, and so God is pushing this before him uh, again and again and again. And, and what I really want this to do for us, I hope, and I think the point of, the, of, the prophetic, of this prophetic uh, word here from Jonah is it's really a question that's raised for us. What's your heart for the city? This is a question, obviously, that challenged Jonah, but Jonah had to come back and sit this down and write this out for the rest of the people of Israel to challenge them on their narrow view of God's grace, their narrow view of God's mercy, their narrow view of who God is. And it's a book that challenges us again today. And so uh, I'll ask you again, what's your attitude towards the city? Is it like that of Jonah? You just look at the crime, the poverty, the racism, and you just say, oh, I, I want nothing to do with it. You know, I just need to get out to the suburbs, the country, where everything is wonderful and great. Uh, Tim Keller notes this about the city. He says, a lot of people don't like the city, and one reason is that it's full of so many people who are different from them, politically, culturally, racially, and economically. No matter who you are, that's true. That's what a city is. You're not in a city if you look around and everyone looks like you. Right? That's what's beautiful about a city, right? And that's what's challenging about a city. That's what's hard about a city, right? And so the text is challenging our prejudices. It's challenging our privilege, just like it challenged Jonah and challenged Israel, saying, you know, do you look at the people in the city, the, those different people, their alternative lifestyles, their alternative spirituality, um, with their, you know, coming from different racial backgrounds, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and you say, I don't want anything to do with them, right? Are, are you in the same place that Jonah is? Do you just have this kind of knee-jerk reaction against uh, the city? It's easy to judge the immorality of the city, condemn the sin in the city. It's easy to write the city off as a godless place, but, but God's point to the prophets is that's exactly where you need to be, right? If there's sin, if there's evil, if there's struggle, that's where the good news of the gospel uh, needs to go. Uh, maybe for some of you, it's more indifference towards the city. You go, yeah, I'm just, I just got, you know, too, too much other stuff going on to really think about the city, uh, worry about the city, uh, think about the city. I know for myself, you know, growing up out in the sticks, out in the country, um, pretty sheltered lifestyle, and, you know, it's like, it's easy to just ignore the city and just be like, I'm just doing my thing, living my life out here, and just ignore all the, the big bad stuff going on in the city. It's easy to just live our comfortable middle class lifestyle and just kind of stay away from all the drama that the city involves. And, and I know it's been incredibly eye-opening for me uh, living in the city now here the last five years, um, particularly moving into the area where we're at now uh, down in the southeast and uh, opening up our home to a lot of foster care kids and, and hearing crazy stuff, you know, the, you know, their run-ins, you know, with, you know, boyfriends that are in jail, you know, people living on the brink of poverty, you know, two of the girls' families have both lived uh, on the street at various points in their lives, and to just be confronted with just the brokenness around me, I mean, it's beginning, obviously, to work on my heart, but, but I would say for most of my life, right, I've just lived, you know, just totally oblivious to all of those things, just naive to what's going on, and and yet to be here in the city, to be in the mix, beginning to see God working in my heart, it's been really a, a powerful thing. Uh, maybe you like the idea of living in the city. <laughs> maybe you're like young and cool and you love the microbrews, you love the coffee, you're like, the city's great, I love art prize, I love all the cool stuff going on around here, and, 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 and yet you're not really wrestling with some of the challenging sides of the city. Maybe you're kind of a social media activist. You're out there on your smartphone, you know, liking everything and, you know, tweeting about everything that's going on, and yet you don't really have that many relationships with uh, people that are different from you, different ethnic backgrounds, different races, different socioeconomic backgrounds. You know, the, the extent of your life is mostly just liking different causes and various uh, things uh, like that. If, if that's where you find yourself, I, I challenge you to get a little bit more in the mix. Uh, 
Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, in, in a, a New Yorker article, Small Change, the Revolution Will Not Be Tweeted, uh, said this. I thought this was really helpful. Um, he said, the platforms of social media are built around weak ties. Twitter is a way of following or being followed by people you may have never have met. Facebook is a tool for efficiently managing your acquaintances, for keeping up with the people who you'd not otherwise be able to stay in touch with. That's why you can have a thousand friends on Facebook uh, that you could never have in real life. The internet leads us to exploit the power of these kinds of distant connections with marvelous efficiency. It's terrific at the uh, diffusion of innovation, interdisciplinary collaboration, seamlessly matching up buyers and sellers and the logistical functions of the dating world. But weak ties seldom lead to high-risk activism. Do you get that? He's saying, you know, you can do a lot of great things on Twitter and on Instagram and on Facebook, and you can track causes, and you can get information around, and if something's going down, you can tape it right on your, you know, smartphone and send it to the world. And so, you know, it disseminates information instantly. That can be very helpful. That can be very valuable. Um, but it tends to produce weak ties, right? It tends to produce, you know, very basic connection with people. You're not really building deep uh, relationships. And in the article, he goes to show that the strong ties, how they developed um, in the uh, midst of the civil rights movement, you know, they allowed people to get out there, take beatings, you know, abuse, uh, verbal and physical, to really change this, the civil ills that are out there. And, and Gladwell wonders if the weak ties of our times, so simply the kind of the social media connections are going to be able to really get into the deep, dark places of our world and of our cities, right, if we're not willing to get our hands dirty and build uh, some of those stronger ties. And so I'd encourage our church as we think about this, we're always pushing people down into community to building some of those strong ties, getting into relationships with people, doing life alongside of people, getting into mission together in the trenches. It's building those strong ties, those deeper relationships where you're really face-to-face -face with people from a different background, right? Where you're hanging out with people uh, from a different ethnicity, where you're hanging out with people that are really in the midst and the struggle that you really uh, are building some of those deeper relationships and some of those deeper ties. Uh, maybe this morning you're like neck deep in the city. You're serving at your job full-time. You're a nonprofit, and you're just like, I'm just drowning under the weight of all the challenges that the city provides, right? I love the city, but, you know, it's so exhausting. It's so challenging. The, the, the issues of poverty and racism are so complex and so difficult. You know, how do we find the resources to change? And how do we find the resources um, to grow? And that's why we need to recognize what I think this book of Jonah does for us so well. It points us uh, beyond Jonah, right, the very imperfect prophet who's running away from his mission, from his calling, from God's heart for the city. And, and what the book does is it refocuses us on God and his beautiful missionary heart for the city, right? That's the punchline of the story, isn't it? And should not I, should not God pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left and also much cattle. Right? God's compassion is what compels us to really get into the mix. God's compassion is what compels us to move out of our safe, comfortable little circles in which we live, uh, to really roll up our sleeves, get our hands dirty in the real stuff uh, of life here in the city. And this word pity here is a beautiful word here. It might just kind of think of pity as a very, yeah, uh, those poor people over there. Uh, but this is the same word in Hebrew for compassion, for being deeply moved. God is deeply concerned by uh, the sin in the city, the evil in the city, the brokenness in the city. Tim Keller says uh, that the word concern uh, God uses here is the word to weep. He says, Jonah, look at what I weep over. I weep over the masses. I weep over the city. When you see so many people, why don't you weep over them? Why doesn't compassion spring up? Jonah, I saved you by grace. I reached into the belly of fish and saved you. And yet we see Jonah with just no concern, no heart for the city. Keller goes on to say, your attitude towards the city is one index of whether or not you know you're a sinner saved by grace. Let me say that again. He says, your attitude towards the city is one index of whether you know or whether or not you know that you're a sinner saved by grace. See what Keller's saying? Right, if you are a sinner, right, saved exclusively by God's grace, right, not because of anything you've done, how can you look down on anybody else in the city? How can you look at those evil people out there or those people 
when you recognize that you're a sinner saved exclusively by God's grace, so if, you, if you get a hold of God's heart, if you get a hold of his grace in your life, your heart is going to have to be moved. It's going to have to be softened to the people in your city. And it's interesting, isn't it? God isn't only concerned about the souls of these 120,000 people. Isn't his grace He's also concerned about the cattle? <laughs> well, look at God. He's even concerned about the animals. And you're thinking, oh, what are animal rights activists before his time? Uh, what what, what uh, the narrator is actually trying to say here is, is God's concerned about the flourishing of the city, right? The cattle were the currency of that time. Right? He's not just concerned that these souls kind of get beamed to heaven someday. He's concerned for the flourishing of that city, right? They're the chief economic driver of that time, right? Cattle, which would have been their food. It would have been their clothing. It would have been their milk. It would have been any number of other things, right? He's concerned for that great city, for those people. They know the true and living God and that their city would flourish for the glory of God and the common good of the city. That's what, that's what God's heart breaks for that the city would flourish, there'd be a place where God would be glorified, where his grace would be experienced, uh, and the common good could be pursued together. And so God is challenging Jonah to wrestle with God's heart for the city. He's writing this book to Israel to challenge them to wrestle with God's heart for the city, and he's challenging us through this letter, you know, all these many thousands of years later, to wrestle with what it looks like to have a heart for the city. Israel knows the Creator God, the one who made the heavens and the earth. Israel know, or we know today, and Israel knew then, right, that God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. How is it that we don't have compassion? How is it that we're not moved outwards into the great cities of our world? Well, Israel failed to respond to the message of Jonah. They failed to take uh, God's blessings to the nations. They failed to be a kingdom of priests. They failed uh, to have compassion on the nations around them, right? They, they answered that question, should I not have compassion on the nations around them, by saying, no, we're not going to have compassion, right? And Israel went off into exile, ironically, by the very Ninevites uh, that had just repented uh, at God's uh, blessing. And yet God, in his grace and his mercy, in his relentless love, in his relentless grace, in his missionary heart to see the gospel go to the nations, would send a greater Jonah uh, to come and rescue God's people, restore them to God's heart for uh, the nations. So, of course, I'm talking uh, about Jesus. Confronted by the alternatives of his contemporaries, Jesus identified with this overlooked and underappreciated prophet. In Jesus' time, you know, the Essenes wanted to withdraw from the corruption of the Greco-Roman world of their time. The Pharisees wanted to focus on their purity and distinctiveness. The zealots wanted to take up arms. The Sadducees were just ready to embrace the culture. And yet Jesus said there's another option. There's a Jonah option. You know, we could be a people called to bring God's grace, God's mercy, God's compassion to the world around us. And so in Matthew 12, uh, 38 through uh, 41, uh, we see Jesus uh, saying exactly this to an audience filled with Pharisees uh, in Matthew 12, uh, 38, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. He's saying, what's your agenda, Rabbi? What's your, what's your goal here? And he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. You see, Jesus is telling them, rather than withdrawing or separating or rebelling or embracing Greco-Roman culture, he's calling God's people back to their mission, back to be a light to the nations, back to be a kingdom of priests, back to bring those promises that God had promised to go to the nations through Abraham. And where we see Jonah's culture, right, in this case, or Jesus' culture around him rejecting Jesus. He's saying, you know, the people of Nineveh repented. The people of Nineveh received the grace and mercy of God, and you're going to miss out on this? This is exactly what I have come. I've come to restore um, God's grace to my people and then send them out with these blessings. And so the greater Jonah has arrived on the scene to restore this message, this mission to God's people. And where Jonah uh, threw himself a pity party about God's graciousness, 
But we see in Jesus' life in this, his ministry everywhere, Jesus shared his grace with everyone he met. Where Jonah ran away as fast as he could in the opposite direction of God's purposes, this Jonah would follow God's will perfectly. We see him in the Garden of Gethsemane right before he goes to the cross saying, not my will, but yours be done. This Jonah would follow through with God's purpose and God's plan to redeem. Where Jonah spent three days in the belly of the great fish for running away from God, Jesus would spend three days in the grave because of his obedience to God, because of his commitment to following God, to his commitment to redemption. Where Jonah hated his enemies, Jesus laid down his life for his enemies. And where Jonah left God's question, should I not pity this great question hanging, Jesus definitively answered it once and for all by hanging from a cross. Where Jonah went outside the camp to throw this pity party for himself, Jesus suffered outside the camp to die for his enemies. Hebrews 13, 12 through 16 tells us that Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. And so through this greater Jonah, We've now experienced firsthand God's grace, God's mercy, uh, God's forgiveness for all the ways that we've messed this thing up. And because of God's grace at work in our lives, we can share that with a city uh, desperately in need. Paul Tripp uh, likes to say it this way, no one gives grace better than the person who is deeply persuaded that they need it uh, themselves. And so what would it look like for us uh, as a community to be a community deeply shaped by the grace of God? Uh, deeply moved by the grace of God, deeply with a deep heart for the people uh, around us, right? What would it look like for you to wake up Monday morning and just be reminded of God's grace and mercy in your life? If right now you just feel overwhelmed, as many of us are, uh, trying to start families, raising kids, working jobs, taking care of pets, you know, finishing school, raising one kid and two kids and then three kids and then four kids, right? If you just feel the sense of just overwhelming burden of all that, and then on top of that, hey, do mission, it's probably because you haven't dwelled enough on the grace of God, on the mercy of God, on the goodness of God, on the kindness of God, on his grace at work in our lives, right? People that recognize God's grace at work in our life have plenty of grace to extend to others. What would it look like to have God's heart for the city? As people come into contact with you, as you recognize opportunities, as you see needs to move towards it. And not just solo. I think so many of us get overwhelmed by the prospect of doing this all by yourself. Oh my gosh, before I know it, like, you know, I'm just going to be overwhelmed and I'm not going to be able to do it. And I'm like, exactly. That's kind of the point. We're doing this together as a family. We're doing this in communities. We're doing this as a church. You don't have to take on the whole world's problems by yourself single-handedly. Right? You just get an opportunity to be faithful with the people God brings your way, the people God brings into your life. Uh, it's not like you have to add anything else to your schedule. There are people in your life, unless you are Amish or something and live in a bubble somewhere, right, that need Jesus. Right? You don't need to add anything else to your life. You just need to be faithful with the opportunities uh, that God gives you. What would it look like to have God's heart for uh, our city? And what would it look like to remind yourself right, that God is more than up to the task? Jonah, I'm sure, as he was looking at the prospect of leaving his little country of Israel to go to the vast empire, the Syrian empire, go to the capital, the Nineveh, was surely overwhelmed, right, at the prospect of taking this gospel deep into the heart of enemy territory. What would it look like to get a bigger view of God, the God who is sovereign over the nations, the God of heaven and earth, the God who commands the sea and the storms, the God who commands fish to pick people up and drop them off, the God who continues to relentlessly pursue in his grace and his kindness even his enemies. What would it look like? Followers of Jesus have deeply uh, experienced God's amazing grace, share God's heart for the city, and experience God's power to serve for the glory of God and for the good of our cities. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jonah, the reluctant prophet, and how he gives us a window into our own hearts, um, the ways that we uh, often uh, dislike the city. God, we're afraid of the city. We're uh, apathetic to the city. Uh, we are just uh, not even interested in the city, or maybe we have the best of intentions, but when it comes to really getting our hands dirty, uh, we don't do it. We thank you for the ways Jonah challenges us uh, to look at your compassion, your heart for um, the city. And so I pray now that as we have an opportunity to reflect on the message, we have an opportunity to share uh, the Lord's Supper together, um, that this grace uh, would land on us in all of its power, 
in all of its wonder and all of its beauty, that you'd soften our hearts to our city, uh, soften our hearts to the people around us, and give us um, your heart. We pray all in Jesus' name. Amen.